Richard van Hooydonk told us about the future. He told us about how robots would take over our jobs and that we would live rich lives. But the next two speakers will tell you that's not the future, that's actually happening today. It's not a prediction, it's something that they are already working on. So we have two experts in this field. One will shine his light from the perspective of the Wageningen University. It's uh, Erik Pekkerit. And one speaker will share his light on this material from the Technical University of Delft. So it's about disruptive technologies, what is and what will be. Please welcome to the stage, Mr. Erik Pekkerit. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for inviting me. Um, my speech is about robotics. So this is, uh, for me, robotics. More robots that are working together, um, doing a task. And uh, this is, seems to be an easy task, but it's already a little swarm of robots that can do, that can work all day and night. And, well, that's my dream for also horticulture. So, to start off, what is happening in horticulture? I think a lot of is happening in horticulture. We have mass production. And uh, we are the only industry, probably, where we handle every product by hand, which is not automated yet. Um, if we look to our costs, 30 to 50 percent are labor costs. So there is still a lot of work to be done on robotics. We are now heading to high-tech greenhouses. And if we talk about high-tech greenhouse, we want to keep the greenhouse as close as possible to keep high levels of CO2, to use artificial light. But when we do that, when we close greenhouses, the humidity will increase, the temperature will rise, and uh, can go up to 30 degrees and more. And plants like that. If this, and, and, but you cannot work there anymore, especially with the new types of light. LED light uh, gives a lot of problem to see which fruits should be harvested, because you cannot see which fruit is ripe or not. So in the future, it's still more and more difficult to work in greenhouses. And we need to be hygiene. And all our products need to be traceable, perhaps even to the plant we are growing on. Um, food needs to be safe. And we know that diseases will go to one to another plant by human beings. So if you want to uh, cope with that, we should make systems w which we can rely on. And robotics is one of the challenges. Then we have biological control. We have bumblebees, we have uh, predator mites, we have beetles that can kill other insects so that we can um, have a nice and good crop. But if we want to keep the whole nature in balance, uh, that's very difficult to do it, uh, to look to every plant what it needs. And I think only robotic systems, so what we do is fulfilled intervention when we have a disease. And then all our insects are dead. We don't have the biological control. If we want to achieve uh, something, we have to check every single plant. Is he disease? What kind of insects are there? And now we are getting to get the knowledge to treat every plant with precision horticulture. Legislation, new rules, um, will tighten uh, how we have to deal with our workforce. Uh, they cannot work uh, 24 hours a day, so a robot can. Uh, it's, it's difficult uh, to, 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 to get all the people into the greenhouse every year, every season. And I think that robots can add value add value to the product uh, by reliable and fast uh, delivery that can be uh, predicted very well. So if we look to the demand for robotics, we can see robotics in every stage. We can see robotics in seeding, in planting, cutting, planting, grafting, in growing. Uh, robots that can monitor, that can prune, spray, that can check the disease and water all uh, individual plants. 
most intensive labor task is harvesting. So harvest and buffering still be done, still done by human beings, can be done in the future by robots. And then we have the food processing and packaging, pick, pack and palletize. So horticulture and should endorse robotics um, because there's also a huge market, uh, low costs. Uh, one robot can perhaps replace one human being. It doesn't have to be as fast as a human being. I think the costs are, red, or are already compatible with human beings. So if you have already hundreds of people harvesting tomato, you all probably also need 100 robots. And then the robot, it's, it's not much material. It's all uh, about technology, about software. Um, with robots, you can objective quality, do objective quality assessment. You can uh, automa automate the repetitive tasks year round. Uh, it, they can work in closed greenhouses. Uh, you can more frequent and uh, automate the monitoring of your individual plants. It's safe, hygienic, traceable, and you can work 24-7, and that saves money. And I think it adds value. And now we are on the stage that it's, it's difficult to improve our production. And I think robots can start a new phase of continuous improvement. Now we have all uh, every year a new workforce uh, changing all the time. A lot of management capacity is going to that workforce to organize it uh, all very well. I think if, if you can control production much better, uh, you need robotics. And at the end, we will feed the world. That's our main goal. So, what are the examples? Um, at Wageningen UR, we are specialized in um, artificial intelligence and machine vision applications. Normally, we ask the machine builders to build the robots for us, the hardware. We do uh, integration and programming, uh, learning of uh, new robotic systems. That's our main task, and here are one of the examples. On the top uh, left, uh, yeah, lit pl to plant lit cactus. On the bottom left, to harvest roses. Not yet in practice, but we were close. We have more months, 24-7, uh, uh, harvest robotics. And we, were, we harvested 90% and it was closed. But in the meantime, the rose sector reduces with, with more than half and um, yeah, we couldn't find yet the commercial uh, step. One that reaches the, uh, the commercial step is already strawberry harvesting. Uh, sp colleagues from Spain are quite successful with these robots and also automated guided vehicles on the, on the bottom right are now common practice. What can we expect in the future? And what can we expect outside? What is also already uh, in practice is weeding. We can weed easily with, with, with a robot type of thing. And what you see here is uh, a machine vision system under the weeding uh, device that will keep the whole weeding device on track. So the vision controls the machine behind the tractor, not the, not the tractor itself. And it can also distinguish between weeds and plants. Then we built the vis vision system for asparagus harvesting. Already more robots in practice. Now we are working on broccoli. Well, this was our first attempt and it went wrong. But I, I'm, I'm sure that next time I will be here, we have a perfect uh, broccoli harvesting harvest ma machine. And on the right and the bottom, we are working on aut autonomous vehicles. And this is a master slave uh, example. Then, one of our most advanced European projects on robotics in, agri in horticulture is the, the crops project. And now we have another project that will continue with the crops project. It's called Sweeper. It's sweet pepper harvesting. And I think people who are from horticulture know that sweet pepper is probably one of the most difficult tasks. So we are not aiming directly to have a commercial application. No, we want to build knowledge so that we can make more and more and more robots for you. 
and it works. So we we are already uh, it's already possible to harvest a sweet pepper, not in the speed you would like to see, but the next three years, hear me, we will achieve more speed. But in this project, we work with um, 15 uh, institutes and companies together. We programmed, I think, with more than 20 researchers software in an open source system. It's called ROS, Robotic Operating System. It's in Linux and it's open source and ev everyone can contribute for all of the world. And we also contribute to that open source software environment. And now we, we build there the whole system uh, artificially. So we, me we measured all the plants and, and we br brought in the plants into the simulation area. We brought in the, the robots and from that moment people from Spain can do, can do test, test in simulation but, but can also do tests in Wageningen and all by the Ross community. We also learned how to distinguish between different plant types. So what's the top of the leaf, what's the bottom of the leaf, what's the stem? It's all green, sweet peppers are all green. But by using spectral information, we can distinguish between different plant uh, spe species. We use 3D. And in this project, in the Crofts project, we used an, a, a special 3D sensor, time of flight, with a color camera. And now in the next project, because software is going that fast, we th don't think that we need the 3D camera anymore. Now we have just a 2D camera in the end effector by moving, and we call it SLAM, we can um, yeah, reproduce the whole 3D environment. And we can just, if we see our first sweet pepper, we can go. And by going, we get more information about the area. We can go back, go to the next one. So that will be our task. Cheap components to make robotics work. Just a color camera with some illumination. And also our idea about concepts are ch is changing. Uh, so we would like to bring the human in the loop. And how do, why do we bring the human in the loop? Robotics should be uh, run automatically. Well, it's easy to take the easy ones, but it's difficult to take the difficult ones. So our approach on the sweet pepper task is not to harvest 100%, no, you would like to uh, harvest 50%, but fast, reliable, and we already did some tests, what will happen with the other one? Well, if it's, it's manual labor for us, you, you save 50%, so that's a very good start, but we have to do it fast fr from good quality. We also want to use the human in the loop for um, bringing information. So we also like the idea of tele t telerobotics. So one guy sitting on behind the screen, pointing out the, the fruits that should be harvested, and a robot can do it in his own time. And that one guy can probably control 10, five robots at the same time. So this one, 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 and the robot can do it himself. And we can use the information for learning. So if we use that information, probably at the end of the time, robots can do the basic things themselves. And then we do not have to, to, it's all about error handling. So what we are also focusing on is what will happen with the fruits we do not harvest. Can a human being assist the robot? So uh, the robot reports, I was not successful, help me. And it, the scene will project it to the operator in another room. And he said, you should do that. And uh, then it will be harvested. That are the new ideas in concept thinking on robotic harvesting. Then a lot of work is now done on phenotyping. We all used 2D cameras and we make a rotation and we make 24 pictures, one from the top, and, uh, but it's all average measurements. But now we are able to make these nice 3D pictures and now we can measure the leaf surface in every square millimeter. And that will bring us great opportunities. And um, we are already using that to measure the, the real uh, leaf surface, to measure internode length, to measure the cotyl uh, leaves from the other leaves, to measure the grown-up, to, me to measure stem thickness. All things can be done with this technology, and we can do it on high speed. You see it in the other pictures. Um, some uh, small plant producers are already using the technology. And at the end, if we can measure 
every square millimeter and on plant growth, um, we can and we know what kind of resources are went into the plants. We can do automated modeling. So not measuring, no. We make the plant recipe directly. So that's our ambition and we would like to work on. Then pests and diseases. There are a lot of pests and diseases and we are working to detect them. Uh, we already have nice cameras to measure Phytophthora, but also to measure ripeness of fruits, um, to measure uh, botrytis in roses. Um, and we can see that. So uh, great achievements there. And we are now trying to build it also in robots. So on the top left, we have a robot that's going over cyclamen and measure uh, all type, types of um, diseases, botrytis especially. And we have a, a, a robot that can also measure stem botrytis. And it can already spray in the direction of stem botrytis. Individual plants, individual uh, parts. Autonomous vehicles and probably at the end in the overfield you will see swarms that can tre do treatment on small detail. So that was my part. My colleague uh, Martijn will take over. I took 20 seconds, seconds of his time, but <laughs> no problem. Okay, thank you very much. Eric Pekkerit, <laughs> yes. Right, so Martijn is going to share his ideas uh, on this uh, material. I forgot to say to uh, the audience here uh, present, if you have questions for Martijn or Eric, please make sure to remember them because I will go into the audience uh, in a few minutes with my microphone, microphone so that you can ask your question. I, I mean, I know that uh, Corporate is present here and, and Brinkman and Priva, and I know you guys are all working with this kind of stuff, so I'd like to hear from you. Uh, for the viewers at home, please use the hashtag GreenTechRai so I can read your question off my screen and ask it to Martijn or Eric. So, Martijn, you are the founding director of the Delft BioRob Bio Robotics Laboratory. Another big round of applause for Martijn. Thank you. There you go. Hi, thank you. Uh, before I start, I need to make a, uh, a quick investigation. Now, how many of you are using robotic technology right now? Please raise your hand. Okay, please look around. Okay, so, so you notice not so many people are doing that now. My prediction is, but it's also uh, your job, your task description for the next year, is to increase this number dramatically. Um, but um, stuff is already happening. Um, I'm from the Thier Delft Robotics Institute, which uh, if you take Andre Kuiper's picture, um, you see his very light uh, area is the dark area here, it's the highest density of uh, horticulture. Uh, right in the middle uh, is uh, the TU Delft, so it's uh, no wonder that we also are engaging with uh, um, uh, horticulture robotics. Uh, we're actually doing all kinds of robotics, but ho horticulture is the theme for today. And I'm going to talk about uh, two subjects, actually both of them uh, divided in two. And this is a continu continuation of Eric's story. So Eric talked about uh, harvesting, about monitoring from the ground, about weeding, and I'm now going to talk about monitoring and handling, and then hopefully we have sort of covered the entire process. So uh, monitoring outdoors, everybody's seen these pictures, I took this from the internet. Um, the challenge here is on the one hand, you want these things to be autonomous, so, they, so you don't need a pilot, which is a lot of labor cost, it's mar much more expensive labor than uh, somebody who's doing the work themselves manually. So uh, you want them to be autonomous, starting and landing autonomously at the right place, the base station, so they can upload, download, etc. And at the same time, you want them to have a long range. And how do you combine these two? Well, in fact, you would need wings, not just the propellers, but you, you want wings. So how do winged drones work these days? Well, they are being launched. I found this also on the internet in City Group. They, um, this, this is for the military, unfortunately. We try to stay away very far from the military, but that's how they launch the drones. And then the question is, how do they land? And so here you can see um, still some manual operation. And then, then you can see how the drone is approaching. You see it here on the right. There, do you see it coming? So how does it land? So they, 
yeah, it's so, sort of cruel <laughs> to the machine. But it's also very laborious. You need this, so they, but they basically have a wire there and they, they fly it into the wire and that's how they um, make it go to the base station. So a much better way to do this, uh, and this is uh, an, um, something you can actually buy if you're a hobbyist, is it's a quad rotor, so it has these four propellers. It can lift up like a helicopter, but its body is a wing. So it can tilt and then it can fly very efficiently, very long range, and then it can um, uh, flip back and land vertically. And so uh, my colleague, uh, Bart Remes of uh, Aerospace Engineering, has um, done a lot of research on this. And so this is an autopilot starting the machine. And then in the same movie, I'll, uh, I'll scroll forward a little bit. In, in the same machine, there's an autopilot that does the transition. You see the camera, the onboard camera, so you see the horizon um, flipping over. And, and that transition is really one of the key difficulties that really uh, engages our engineers at the university because uh, this is an uh, aerodynamic regime that's unknown. I mean, everybody knows about helicopters and quad rotors, about stability, everybody knows about planes, but how do you transition stably without uh, uh, getting into a tumble? So this is where the research comes in. And then, of course, uh, at the end of the movie, they, um, uh, they also autonomously land vertically. So there they go, landing again. So this is what we're working on for outdoors uh, uh, monitoring. There's also, there are also some thoughts about indoor drones. So you have a big greenhouse and you have uh, flying uh, uh, s monitors with some sensors on it to do uh, precision farming. Um, I couldn't find any movie on the internet or even a picture about uh, indoor drones. Uh, I did find, find one, but apparently this was not about inspecting in the, in the farmhouse, but it was about uh, just filming the farm so they could move, make a movie about the farm. Anyways, uh, if you really want to do uh, efficient um, flying and navigating inside these uh, uh, um, greenhouses, one of the difficulties is um, a navigation because you cannot just use GPS. There are too many reflections from the iron poles. So you need to, do a need to create a system for that. And the uh, drones need to be small, small, lightweight, and safe. There are people in there. Uh, there are plants in there. They're fragile. You don't want uh, them to crash into them. If they do, it should be lightweight and safe. And so one of the challenges that my colleagues uh, took on is to uh, make autonomy in a very lightweight, small system. And so they created this, uh, the world's lightest and smallest autopilot. It's really, uh, well, as you can see, smaller than, almost smaller than uh, one euro. It's not, not yet cheaper than one euro, but... Uh, but, um, but so this uh, uh, leads to what they call pocket drones. So drones that fit into a pocket, but still they have on board enough sensing and enough uh, um, uh, computing power to really navigate around all of the obstacles. And so uh, my colleagues of the MAV lab, the Micro Aerial Vehicle Lab of uh, Aerospace Engineering created uh, a swarm of these drones that automatically create formations, start flying. And um, not yet in a greenhouse. They're, right now they're working on it with some, maybe some of you even, um, but it's not yet fully commercial. So that's my story about uh, monitoring. Then I continue, uh, s really a different uh, uh, topic, it's handling and packaging. And I think the, the challenges, the, the technical challenges for us as researchers are, there, there are two challenges. It's grasping those delicate products and it is knowing where they are and how they are positioned so you know how to grasp them. And this is a 3D vision problem. So I'm going to dive into those two. Um, first, I'll start with the grasping. So here uh, I have just picked two random movies of, um, out of the hundreds or thousands that we can uh, produce. Actually, I'm quite proud of the Netherlands as we are sort of the technology supplier for horticulture all around the world. This, these are just two of the big suppliers, but this is, it's amazing how much we are delivering. Um, but still you see many hands. So still you see many manual labor on these lines. So there's still a lot to do, and that's actually what we like to do at the university. 
So one of the challenges is to grasp delicate products and at the same time handle the variation of those products. And so we dived, we went all the way back to the design of the human hand and tried to find if there's something in the design, the mechanical design of the human hand that facilitates and make it more easy to, uh, to grasp uh, these variable uh, products. And there is actually. This is the bone of uh, a finger. Uh, there at the end is the fingertip. And if you look at the tendons inside, you can see that they are connected to two parts at the same time. That means if you uh, control the muscle, the muscles here in the, in the lower arm, if you control it, you're not just pulling one of the parts, but you're pulling two parts at the same time. And here there's another one that's also connected like that. This is how, so this is how it's organized in our finger. And the result is that we are not able, you can try it, you're not able to control just the top. You can try it, if you, if you try it, you are not able to control the top, but keep the, the rest of the finger straight. It moves with it. And it seems strange, it's very uh, uh, different from how robots are built usually, but the result is that it's very effective for grasping, because what you see is that it adapts to the shape that is uh, grasping. So now it's uh, taking on a round object, and so it took a round shape, but if you give it, oh, sorry, I have to, um, I had to wait for the movie. If you, so I'm going to show again, it's going to go around the object, and you can see that once the grip is full, the forces are also nicely distributed, so there's no one spot with a very, very high force which might damage the product. And then if you give it a square object, automatically the gripper gets the, share, the square shape, a straight, straight finger shape. And again, the, the forces are equal. And so this is not uh, sensors and computers and controls, and a lot of money, but it is a very clever, bio-inspired human design. And so we took that forward, uh, created all of these grippers, created the spin-off company. Uh, I'm not supposed to, uh, com to say commercial things, but I'm very proud of them at least. And so they, um, uh, they create all of these grippers now uh, for food handling, for basically for any food that won't allow handling with vacuum. So, I mean, vacuum gripping with suction cups it's good, but often leaves marks on your fruit. If you don't want that, then you want mechanical gripping, and then there's this whole line of possibilities. And it actually works. So, so this is not just a theoretical story about how the human finger works and how you can create robots from it, but it's actually in operation right now. So that's, that's the story about grasping and then 3D vision, the last part of my story. Um, um, Here's an example of uh, 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 one of the greenhouses that uh, grow yucca plants. This is how they arrive. Uh, big crates of stems out of uh, um, southern Americas. And then this is how they should be. Well, without the leaves at first and in the pot, they go into the greenhouse. And then after six weeks, or so, I don't know how many, uh, they are these nice plants for IKEA. Um, so how do they get from, from there into there? Well, you have to um, basically take them out of the, the big crate and put them in. And this is being done uh, with human labor right now, but it's really hard to find people who still want to do this work. And so how, how do you automate that? Well, one of the big issues is, uh, one of the big challenges is um, localizing those stems in the, in the crate or more general, a local 3D localization of products in a bin. And so in our jargon, in, a, in, a, in our world, we call that bin picking. And so um, colleagues all over the world, this is an example from Germany where they're doing it for kitchens, but uh, it doesn't matter. All over the world, we're working with uh, uh, 3D cameras, creating a point cloud, and a point, point cloud means basically just a, a 3D data of all of the points of a surface using that point cloud again to, uh, to create the position where the, how and where the gripper should be placed. Uh, 3D vision is becoming more and more affordable. Uh, for prototypes, we usually take these uh, 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 Microsoft Kinect for the Xbox, it's a uh, game computer. It gives you very nice 3D, 3D images. Um, but really the issue is not just having the image, but also understanding it. And that's where learning comes in. You, it's been, uh, 
expl or it's named already a few times, but I'll say how it works. So there's a camera on top. It takes uh, a 2D picture with colors. The picture is also uh, filtered. So the middle picture is a direct result of the top picture by just uh, highlighting all of those pixels where there's a big difference between the color of the left and the right pixel, or at top and bottom. So there's basically the edges. And, and here, the bottom is a, a 3D uh, point cloud. So you see uh, it's not so accurate, but you see the tops of the stems. And then the computer gets all of these inputs and has to create uh, the location of the tops of the stems. And what happens is uh, um, that's where you use a learning algorithm. The computer says, well, probably um, it's this feature. So it's, it's when it's high, it's a top. And when it's on an edge, it's, a, it's, a, it's an edge that we should look for. And when it's the gray color, we should look for it or not. And at first, the computer doesn't know. So the computer creates all of these green circles, but some of them are wrong. And then you train the system. So that's machine learning. Uh, as a person looks at the image and says, this one is wrong. So you click it, it goes away. This one is wrong as well. This one is wrong as well. And if you do that a, f a few hundreds of times, then after a while, the computer learns uh, that it should look more for the edges and less for the depth, or more for the depth and less for the edges, or whatever it needs to learn. So that is how machine learning is being applied right now. And um, uh, we took all of this, put all of the information together, uh, and created this, uh, um, what we call a factory in a day workshop. So we, we take one or two days, and we try to put all the experts together. Um, so this is what Richard also uh, proposed, sort of a black ops team. We call it just a workshop. And, sorry. And then uh, you put everybody together, and with all the technology, all the tools, the ROS that Eric also explained, so this is the software that puts everything together. And then within two days, you can build a prototype, you see it's possible. It's not yet commercial here, it's not yet commercially uh, viable here. But uh, we took it forward from this very hopeful start. We took it forward, and now, as we speak, it's being installed at the company, and they are now uh, probably the first robotized planter. Um, so all of that works. This is the bin picking movie, but I have to skip it. And so the conclusion for Eric and for me together, the take home message is, Robotics in horticulture, robotics for agrotechnology, is very necessary. Eric explained it's necessary, showed that it's possible. We together have shown to you that it's a very active research field uh, in harvesting, quality control, monitoring, handling, packaging. And it is, or at least should be also, a very active uh, industrial undertaking. And so if it's not right now, then we have about 10 minutes, I believe, to make sure that you get started, you get on the way, so that next year it's not us, but it's you who's standing up here talking about robots. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.